Welcome to My Life, Tanya Applied with Rabbi Simon Jacobson, a journey into the deepest teachings of Torah and their application to our personal, emotional, and psychological lives. A good tevach, a good week. We continue our journey in the life-changing Sefer HaTanya. This program is made possible by Rena Lights LLC, and it is in honor and memory of Rab Yesuf Halevi Weinberg Olav HaSholem, Rab Moshe Pinchas HaKoyen Katz Olav HaSholem, and Rab Yael HaKoyen Khan Olav HaSholem. It's also on schus and merit of Rab Zevi Cheskel HaKoyen and Risha Katz, Le'edich Yomim V'Shonim Tevis for many long, healthy years. So we are in the middle of chapter 8, Perich Ches of Tanya, discussing the different activities whether it's in thought, speech, or action, that contaminate and pollute the very pure soul that each of us has within us, which includes, of course, the process of cleansing it, which, as I've explained, I wouldn't define as punishment, but rather as a form of cleansing, cleaning. And depending on the severity of the pollutant, like it is when you wash clothing, for example, if it's a very superficial stain, you can clean it by just perhaps, by, like dust, you can just clean it by shaking it out. If it's something a little deeper, it needs to be washed out, chemicals, and whatever it takes to remove the toxins. But the thing we have to always remember is that the soul is always pure. Neshama shenasatu bitahidihi, as we say every morning. And that's precisely why we need to know, as we discussed at length in the previous share. Why we need to know, because every blemish, when you're dealing with something that was so pure, matters. It's not insignificant. When a person, for example, psychologically speaking, when a person who's experienced trauma or they experienced negative things in their lives, so sometimes they get desensitized to the point where they expect things to be negative. They get used to it. So like someone will say, it's not so bad. I've already experienced worse, so to speak. The Tanya expecting the highest standards for us is saying no. Even anything that's somewhat somewhat of a blemish that wanders off and is not aligned with the divine purpose of your life needs to be addressed. And that's what we've been learning, the different forms of that type of behavior. We talked about, to just sum up in Pedic Ches itself, he spoke about um, things that are permitted like, the, like what he spoke about, that when a person eats something, we're talking about something kosher, but it was eaten not l'shem shemaim, not for the sake of heaven. So because it became part of your body, part of your flesh and blood, so therefore, and that becomes immediate, so therefore, as long as it's not been elevated, it needs to be cleansed. What he called chibut kever What's chibut kever That the body needs to be cleansed from the contamination of that moment even where something was eaten not completely purely for the divine purpose, in order to cleanse it and to purify it from, its, from the impurities, from the toxins. The next example he gave was he spoke about Devarim Betel and Beheter, someone who's like an Amor, it's a person who, who cannot learn Teda. So, he's, so what does he speak about? He speaks about things that are worthless, wasted words that don't have any value. But it's Beheter, because he can't learn. But since it's, it's Tvarim Betelin, we're not talking about things that are not permitted. That we're going to discuss soon. So therefore, since it's already not pure holiness, and even though it's not his fault because he didn't have anything else to talk about because he doesn't learn Teda, doesn't have to learn Teda, Sarech L'tayi Nafsheh Metuma Zu De Klipa Zu Aide Gilgula B'Kafa Kela So his spirit, here we're not dealing with food which became part of the body, the flesh and blood. Here we're talking about speech. So his needs to have, kafakela, which as we spoke is the sling, is the, the, the exact def- definition of kafakela we learned, was, was um, this, this has to be flung through the hollow of a sling, which as we discussed, was that the soul goes through a process of being shown and imagining its life, both extremes, its purity, and what it's transgressed. And that is a painful experience, but that pain causes a cleansing. 
because it's an awareness and ultimately a repair. Okay, and so that's where we're up to. Now the, Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe is going to continue now and speak about Avul the Dibur Masurim. Let's continue learning inside. Now this will be talking about Varim Mutarim. Yes, wasted words, worthless words, worthless discussion. Dvarim Betelim. But they were not forbidden. Remember, we learned there are three categories. There's, there's mitzvah, things you must do that you're obligated to do. This is manifesting the divine will and divine plan in existence. That would be divrek dusha, person davens, person learns, vidabartabam, speaking words of teda, speaking words of compassion to someone. He's saying words of tefillah. Then there's dvarim that are mutarim, which goes in the category of klipas nega. So it's allowed, but it's not, it's, it's neutral. Now you can speak about, let's say, food. You could speak, go shopping. You could speak about matters of this material world of survival. But it could be l'shem shamayim, or it could be not for the sake of heaven. And then there needs to be some cleansing. And then there's dvarim masurim, things that are completely off, off limits, forbidden. That's what he's addressing. the dvarim masurim, with forbidden discussions, discussions, things he's not allowed to speak about. And he gives an example, kamoi, such as litzonis, the loshen hara, ukiyetzibahem. Mockery and slander, Lashon Hara, speaking negatively about somebody. Those are things that the Torah forbids. It's not neutral at all, God forbid. Ukiyetsu Behem, and similar to that. Shehein Mesholosh Klippus Atmeis Legamri. These are powered and they originate, they're empowered and energized from the three completely impure shells and husks. The ones that are off limits. And if a person enters there, he's now contaminating himself with these very negative energies. So here, cleansing it by shaking out the garment, whether it's, we spoke about the body before, but now the soul, kafa kela, shaking out the garment is not enough. It's like if you have dust on your garment, then you can just shake it out. But if the dust has gotten deeper, and now we're talking about clippers that have the toxins that have entered, Think of it like poison, not just externally and superficially, we can just shake it off. It's become part of the person because, because it's so toxic. So here, ein kafa kela levade Here, kafa kela alone, that process of cleansing that we spoke about before, that alone is not sufficient. Latayr ulahavir to mosima nefesh, to cleanse and detoxify the soul. From, the, from this impurity. Rather, the soul must also go down to purgatory to Gehenna. So the Alter Rebbe now introduces Kafa Kela and Chibata Kever is lesser known. But they are forms of cleansing. As we said, it's all part of a process of purifying. Imagine something can get dirty and you don't have a way of cleansing it. That would be far worse. So again, let's not look at it in the negative, look at it as a process of how do you clean something. When something's dirty, we have a way of cleansing it. But now everybody's more familiar with Gehenna, which is sometimes called purgatory, sometimes called hell. However you define it, what is that? So let's discuss that for a moment, because this, just as it is with the other things, it's not a physical element here. Everyone imagines it like very, very powerful fires and the soul goes through them and gets burned and gets hurt. Yes, that's a muscle to explain, just as fire can burn something out, but fire also is a cleanser. You put things in fire, that's how you kasha an oven, till it becomes white hot, a fire. So fire is indeed, it's powerful, it can destroy, but here the intention is cleansing. But this is a far deeper cleansing. That's not like just shaking out a dirty garment, a dusty garment. Now the garment has to go through a process of real cleansing, and that's what Gehenna is. Why? Because the toxins here are far stronger. We're not talking about someone, we're not minimizing speaking wasted words, worthless words, but they're not us, Vorim Asurim. Remember Asurim from the word Asur, be kosher, be That is bound and trapped and locked, sealed in the power of the negative forces. When you're exposed to that, that's a true poison. 
And to do that, we need to have kafakil alone is not enough. But he says, from the language, it appears clearly that kafakil is also needed. And the, and the explanation is very clear. Why? Because when you, before you clean something really, you put it through, let's say, a, a deep cleansing process, a deep detoxification process, first you shake it out because you want to get rid of the dust. You see this all the time. Like before you wash something, first you shake it out to get rid of the dust that you can, and then the washing and the, and the cleansing will take care of the deeper stains or the ones that have had a deeper impact on the garment, using that example. So here, the kafakel is necessary to get rid of the original dust, so to speak, that gathered. But then there's also the Gehenim, which is the fire that burns, like a new spiritual fire in this case, that cleanses the soul and removes the toxins from the Dvarim Asurim. As I know you could say, well, look, who doesn't speak sometimes, let's use the example he said, who doesn't speak Litsonis uh, Makari and Loshan Hara? Just because it's done and people take it easy and, and people are accustomed to it doesn't make it less of a toxin. It just means we got used to it. But the Tanya is explaining, based of course on Halachas and Teira, that Makari and, and Loshan Hara are indeed serious crimes. And they impurify a pure soul. And as such need this level of cleansing. Now let's just touch upon one interesting um, note here. He said, it comes from Shalosh Klipas Atmeis, Ma'amakari, Diburim Asudim. If you go back to the end of chapter 1, it would appear, he says there clearly, in the end of chapter 1, he says, Litzonis comes from Klipas Nega, from the Dal Yisei de Sarayim, yes, the four negative elements, but of the middle clip, the Klipas Nega, which is the the radiant clipper, not Shalosh Klipas Atmeis. So how does he say here, Litzonis, comes to Shalosh Klipas Atmeis? So to answer a question with a question, he also adds Lashon Hara here. And then the chapter one, he doesn't mention Lashon Hara. He mentions different types of, uh, of, of uh, the, what does he say in the end of, let's look there in the end of chapter one. So he says, like this, that, um, That's what he says there. Those four things. He doesn't mention Lashon Hara. So clearly you see that he mentions Lashon Hara, you have to say that Lashonas, there's two types of Lashonas. You can mock something more as wasted words, you know, empty, empty humor. But there could be also a mockery that's like Lashon Hara. Destructive mockery. You mock a person to the point that you insult them. Being that he puts it together, Lashon Hara, now we have another category that's not just empty, which also needs cleansing, but not the level of Gehenim that we're talking about. That's what he refers back there in chapter 1, the end of chapter 1. So you see a distinction between things that are forbidden and things that are not Kedusha, but they're not absolutely forbidden, even though Dvarim B'Telem in general is forbidden because you're not learning Teda. But in this context, the words you're saying are not as destructive as real slander and mockery of a, of a person. That's what he's saying here. Okay. So now we have established the concept of Tzichim Leded Legehenim which creates a deeper form of cleansing. Now he's going to go and speak about yet another scenario. Remember, before he spoke about somebody who speaks Dvarim B'Telim Beheter. Like an Amoritz, he can't learn, Teireh. So Bemela, he doesn't have an Isr when he talks Dvarim B'Telim because he can't learn Teireh. So you can't hold him responsible to learn all the time. So therefore, he's, he's allowed to speak things that are worthless. We're not talking about things that are forbidden. But since the bottom line is that it comes from Klippus Nega, therefore there is a certain level of contamination. What about a person who could learn Tera? And he speaks Dvarim B'Tela. So there, now we're going into the category of doing something forbidden. So that's what he's going to address now. Again, the thoroughness of the Alter Rebbe. He says, 
Misha Efsule Lasik Bateda. This is in direct contrast. Before he said, Misha Kagoin Amara Sha'ina Yachalimud. And here we're talking about She Efsule Lasik Bateda. The same is true for someone who's able to immerse himself in Tayra study, in Tayra study. The Asik Bedvarim Bateilim, and instead immerses himself in worthless discussion. So we're not talking about necessary Lashon Hara and Litzanis, because that was covered already. We're talking about worthless discussion. But he could learn Teir. So this is new, a new scenario. So, so here too, Ein kafakelo levade moyel lenafshei lemorko ulezachacha. In this case as well, like he said before, kafakela, that process of cleansing of kafakela. The hollow of a sling, which is the idea of the soul going from one extreme to another, being shown these scenarios that cause it pain to cleanse it, that too is not sufficient. Kafakel alone cannot help a soul to be cleaned and purified. Since he's now have has another additional element, not just speaking worthless words, but also an avon the sin. There's a sin been performed here. The sin of bittel teda. Bittel teda means a person a person who has could have learned Teda and did not learn Teda. Teda is what connects us. It's our life and our sustenance. So think of someone who's not drunk water for several days. It's going to have an effect on them. Teda is compared to water, and that's why we need it all the time. And a person can't go three days without water. So a person can't go without Teda. That's why we actually read the Teda every three days at least. But it goes further. Mitzvah of limit that Teda is all the time. So someone who was transgressed that, so it's not just the Dvarim Betelim aspect, that he spoke things that were wasteful, worthless discussion. But now we have a case where his actual sinful, and that sin comes from Shalosh Kippusat like all sins. So there, to be cleansed, the soul needs not kafakel alone. You can't just shake out the dust of the soul. The soul needs specific, severe punishments for the particular sin of neglecting the Teda. So neglecting the Teda has a particular power and negative energy because you've been deprived of what we're supposed to. It's like a person who hasn't eaten or drinking for quite a while. They can't just start eating and drinking. It can have a negative impact, in this case a destructive impact. And that's why there's a requirement for severe punishments. He doesn't speak about what the punishments are. But let's again, let's not use the word punishment. I would say severe cleansing. Intense cleansing would be even a better way of putting it. Because kafakela alone is not enough. Why is the sin of Bittl Teda so powerful? Because Talmud Teda connected Kulam. Talmud Teda corresponds to all the mitzvahs. Teda, every mitzvah has its powerful force. And not doing a mitzvah, of course, creates a blemish, creates a taka, creates a, it pollutes the person. Doing something that you're not supposed to do is equally pollutant. But learning Teda is a, is a central mitzvah. Because Teda immerses us in what God wants of us. So if a person knows what God wants and learns Teda, and then in actuality, may not do a certain mitzvah or may transgress a negative mitzvah. We're not talking about mitzvahs that are foundational ones, even though we don't measure mitzvahs, but a mitzvah that is a specific thing. So you could say, yes, that needs to be cleansed. So I'm not doing a mitzvah sesa or being even a mitzvah sesa or, or being even a mitzvah sesa. But since teda, if you don't have teda, then you don't even know what God wants of you. And that has a deeper impact on a person. And that's why the cleansing is so much more necessary. 
So both we understand the greatness of the mitzvah, it's immersion in your very mission of life, aligning yourself with God. So every mitzvah aligns you. But Teda is the overall alignment. It's like this is the mandate. All the mitzvahs come from Teda. So the oven of Bittl Teda, the sin of neglecting Teda, is a very powerful one, has deep impact. And that's why it needs, without even spelling out which, strong cleansing, intense cleansing. What he calls ancient chamurim. Shaminishim al Bittl Teda beprotis that are specifically, specifically tailored toward this particular sin. In contrast to other sins. And now he says, he adds even more. Again, when you read this, you can come away thinking, all this, it creates such a negative energy. But you have to think it's all coming from love. When you love something, you want to make sure it's as pure as possible. But now he adds, Milvad, this is besides Einesha Kloli. We talked about the Einesha Prati, the specific cleansing, intense cleansing necessary to counter and cleanse from this lack of being immersed in Teda. This is besides the general Einesha Kloli, the general cleansing. The whole Bittl Mitzvah that is applied to all, to every time that you neglect. Any positive commandment. So mitzvah Talmud is a mitzvah. But like we explained, it's a particular mitzvah that's more powerful and has a unique power. And therefore it has, has particular a cleansing, necessa- a necessary cleansing. But that's besides, that Alter Rebbe doesn't want to leave out the fact, it also goes into the category of all mitzvahs being neglected, God forbid. A general anus for, for, for a bit of any mitzvah sesa, for any positive mitzvah. Machmas atzlus. Due to neglect, idle neglect. Atzlus is laziness. So though this applies to every mitzvah, but a teda too. So in other words, in addition to the fact that you have not, that the person who has not learned teda and was over in the oven, was able to learn, did not learn. Anamar, well, Anamar has not the capacity, so you can't hold him responsible. And yet, he also needs the cleansing because of the Dvarim Betelim, even Beheta that he said. But here, he could have learned Teda. He could have drank the water. He could have fed himself and nourished himself with the divine wisdom and the divine plan and the mission. And he did not. So in addition to the specific cleansing that that requires, is also the general cleansing of neglecting a mitzvah sesa. And what is that cleansing? Yet another level of cleansing the Alter Rebbe is bringing here. So we learned about uh, we learned about Chibut Akeva, we learned Kafa Kela, we learned Gehenim, we learned now Enshim Chemurim without spelling it out. And now, what is the the general cleansing due to idleness, due to Laziness, a person didn't learn Teda because he was lazy. That is the Gehenim Shel Shalik Kemavur B'Mokemachar. That cleansing is through a Gehenim, a purgatory of snow, as explained elsewhere, and that's particularly to give the Maramokim, it's Rab Chaim Vital, Lukut Teda La Rizal, that Rab Chaim Vital composed, the portion of Shmois. He speaks about Gehenim shel shelek and Gehenim shel esh. So let's explain what that is. So now the Alter Rebbe is introducing the two types of purgatory. One of snow and one of fire. Again, we have to always not use, make sure not to anthropomorphize these concepts because we're not talking about physical items. We're f- talking about physical expressions because the Teter speaks in a language that we can all relate to. So what's the difference between fire and snow? They're opposites. Snow is very cold. Fire is very hot. So they correspond because every form of cleansing has to be the cleansing according to what, what, what was uh, toxified. Every toxin needs a cleansing of that toxin. If you're going to apply a certain type of detoxification to a toxin that doesn't respond to it, you won't accomplish the job. So there are sins, there are transgressions, that we'll call them displacements, when we get disaligned and therefore toxified through sins of passion that come from heat, from passion, 
from desire, from a, you see, a sin of passion. That's a fiery energy. Ash. So what's the tikkun for that? The tikkun for that is a purgatory of Ash. What does that mean spiritually? Spiritually means that you're immersed in something that burns out that passion in order to transform it, that you should be able to have passion toward good things, passion toward godliness, passion toward love of God, passion toward learning Torah. Then there are sins that come from a certain aloofness, from indifference, apathy, coldness. A person is in a state that's not coming from warmth, desire, lust, and passion, but, we're, but rather it's coolness and indifference. He's cool. So how do you t- detoxify coolness? Through shalag. Through immersing that soul in a coolness that cools off the coolness toward Kedusha and allows them to could cleanse, to be open then, to experience and be cleansed and be experienced the divine yet again. So the neglect of a mitzvah, which comes from either laziness or uh, idleness, that he calls atzlus, that is connected to a coolness, and that's where this Gehenim Shal Shala comes into play. The Alter Rebbe doesn't mention Gehenim Shal Eish. He did mention Gehenim in general before, when he talked about removing the, the impurities that come from Diburi Masurim, which is Makari Olosh and Hara. But there, it's not clear whether he's talking there if it's coming from passion. Clearly, it's not idleness, because a person talking Olosh and Hara, he's invested in it. And sometimes people are passionate about that type of negative talk. But he doesn't spell it out. Here he does spell it out. So again, you see a certain thoroughness. Not to say this is an encyclopedia of every form of cleansing, but it definitely has covered quite a few levels here. Chibut HaKever, Kafa Kela. Speaking about Gehenim. Now Gehenim Shel Shalak. In addition to the Enshim Chamurim. So now... we see that actually in the cleansing process of someone who could learn Teda and doesn't learn Teda, there are three things. There's the Kafa Kela that comes over, um, when a person rather spoke about wasteful words and could have learned Teda and didn't learn Teda, so there's the Kafa Kela to clean out and shake out the dust from the Dvarim Betelim. There's the ancient Chamurim that are specific to the neglect of learning Teda. Of, the, of, of waste of not learning Teda, and there's the Gehenim of Shalik, the Einish Kloli, the, the general cleansing for laziness and for idleness. And that's what the Alter Rebbe says. And here we will stop. And again, let's keep the focus. This is all about how beautiful a person is. When you have a child that you love, you make sure that every piece of dust, every blemish, every toxin, is, first of all, you try to prevent it, but if it does get stuck, you do everything possible to clean it, to bathe, to cleanse. And the al wants to give us every possible, is gathering and explaining to us how every possible toxin can be addressed and cleansed. So we should only know of the positive and come to a point of Ruach Atuma Ave Aretz, as we learned earlier, that all toxins and all impurities will be removed in this world with the Gula Mitis Vashlema. You can go to tanyaapply.com and find all the previous classes as well as a forum where you can submit any question. Good to go. This has been My Life Tanya Applied with Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Please join us again next week. Visit chasidasapply.com for archived classes and more resources.